Good afternoon, distinguished participants. How are you today? Good. So, um, good. yep, yeah. Very good, thank you. Thank you. So, um, uh, thank you for participating to both who are watching online and those who are present in the broadcasting room at AIT Thailand. I'm Tani, Unit Program Officer Management, uh, implementing the EU funded Switch Asia. I would like to extend warmest welcome to all of you to the regional policy dialogue to promote sustainable lifestyle through tourism sector. This is the first in the series. We have two more sectors coming in a couple of months and we have an honor to deliver this hybrid event with AIT or Asian Institute of Technology, one of our regional centers of excellence. The ultimate goal of this joint effort is to promote and enhance understandings and application of sustainable consumption and production, or we, we know as SCP, in policies and implementation. We hope that SCP is promoted to be an effective tool to plan for national resources management, social economic development, and especially during this pandemic, we hope SCP can be adopted as a policy guidance for all sectors to build back better. Before I give the floor to Dr. Villard, I would like to thank all speakers for that time um, to share experiences and I hope our participants be encouraged to provide feedbacks, ask questions, give comments and exchange your views. So I wish you all a fruitful one and a half hour dialogue. Thank you. Dr. Villard, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Mr. Tuni, uh, for your well, welcome uh, to all of us. Uh, my name is uh, Vilas from uh, AAT. Uh, I'll be acting as a moderator uh, within this afternoon session. Uh, so according to the agenda, uh, we could going to have a first part as an introduction. Uh, after that, uh, we have a short video uh, in order to uh, present an uh, overview of uh, our topic. It will be a short video and I will summarize uh, some of the key parts uh, from the video. Uh, after that, we have a total of uh, three presentations uh, by our expert and practitioners. Uh, so those will continue uh, until about uh, 5.15. Uh, just to also remind uh, all participants uh, we have a Q&A session before we finish uh, this afternoon. So you may like to start uh, sending any question, uh, comment uh, to the chat. I hope you can access uh, the chat box uh, on the Zoom. And our team uh, would uh, manage in the last part to accommodate uh, any question uh, to respond to all of you. Uh, uh, next, uh, let's uh, move on. Uh, I'd like to invite Ms. Uh, Helena Ray, uh, Program Officer of UNEP, uh, to provide introduction to this uh, seminar. Ms. Helena, please. Thank you, Professor Villas. Uh, huge thanks to organizing for, for um, this important webinar and inviting me to, to give opening uh, remarks. Uh, good morning and good afternoon to all. Um, as you well know, COVID-19 has made definitely us to rethink the way uh, how we live and how we travel. Questioning the impact of our travel in leisure on our health and consumption choices. The tourism sector is facing many environmental impacts due to the pandemic, which I highlight here in the next slide. The tourism sector, um, it's, it's not only facing uh, uh, environment impacts, but economic impacts that will be shared with our panelists today. My intention is not going on details on each one of the impacts in related sustainable development goals, as some of, we, uh, some of those will be addressed by the panelists today. Um, could, you, um, could you please put the slide on so everybody can see? Um, so, uh, in, in general terms, main environmental impacts relate to the increase of waste generation, water use and chemicals, as well as change in travel mobility as a response to the increased health and safety requirements. 
travel facilities, tourism business and tourism and tourists will be producing more waste than usual, including uh, masks, gloves, and other protected equipment, as well as food packaging products that may be infected with the virus. When not soundly managed, infected waste could be subject to uncontrolled dumping and pollution, leading to public health risks and secondary transmission to, of diseases to, of humans. Travel mobility behaviors have also changed with people looking for more local and regional tourism. In China, where tourism is uptaking, a recent research of Skyscanner found out that the intention to fly in 2020 dropped 70% in Asia. This will definitely have a decrease uh, in terms of emissions. Um, however, it's expected that the rebound and the retake of tourism uh, will take it um, to previous levels as, as before the crisis. This could be an opportunity to develop a more sustainable tourism products and services for these new concerned tours. Consumers are now preferring to avoid crowded spot, uh, tourism hotspots. Um, travel for shopping has dropped to the bottom of popularity list and tourism in natural areas increased 200% in some countries. These trends also indicate that traditional mass tourism has reached its peaks in growth. In contrast, ecotourism, cultural and adventure tourism are taking the lead and are pretty predicted to grow faster over the next two decades. This is particularly important as tourism has helped conserve natural and protected endangered species. In the absence of tourists, the tourism impact, the, eco the economic impacts for nature and communities can be dramatic. Tourist data shows that people do not change behavior based on what they should do, statistics, nor uh, negative future scenarios. People make decisions based on price, accessibility, and additional criteria like safety, well-being, or trends. Sustainability today is not the defining criteria for tourism choices, and there is a lack of a affordable and sustainable tourism products and services. As beyond the individual, tourists, governments, and business must provide information, promote uh, positive behavior change, and support new business models to make healthy and sustainable travel the default option. In a change of world, during post-COVID, our living and lifestyles decisions will determine our future and the future of tourism. I'm a stronger believer that this pandemic has emerged as an opportunity for us to incorporate sustainable consumption and production patterns to build back, back better the, the tourism sector post-COVID-19. I hope the interventions today inspire you in shaping the travel that we all uh, want and that is sustainable. Um, thank you for listening um, and back to you, Professor Villas. Thanks very much, uh, Helena. I think a uh, short but a sweet, very informative uh, presentation. Uh, I think this would be a good chance uh, for us to continue with uh, a video presentation. Uh, we have prepared this so that we can capture some of the key information. So let's uh, watch our short video. We have about five minutes. The effects of COVID-19 are felt around the globe, more so for the tourism industry, one of the hardest hit economic sector. The data from the United Nations World Tourism Organization suggests a decline of 58% and 78% in international tourist arrivals during 2020 and has 100 to 120 million direct tourism jobs at risk. The global pandemic has caused unprecedented socio-economic impacts and at the same time, raised our awareness of the role sustainability needs to play in our everyday life. 
It represents an opportunity to accelerate sustainable consumption and production patterns and building more resilient, sustainable industry. We need a long-term and holistic thinking to transition to a more sustainable tourism model based on social inclusion and the restoration and protection of the environment. There is no doubt of the great benefits tourism sector provides in terms of socio-economic development and employment, which are now at stake. But it's not too late. We have one planet. We need to do our part. It is time to share and learn from each other and see the silver lining amidst today's challenges in building back the tourism industry better. We can learn from good practices. Some examples include hotels opting for energy efficient solutions like solar energy power heaters, reducing the carbon footprints. There are some destinations offering ecotourism packages and caring more to reduce plastic waste and trace and track the waste produced by their guests and consciously aim to reduce it. Simple efforts like eco-friendly detergents could have long-lasting positive ecological impact. Some hotels and resorts have started rainwater harvesting and started a cycle of using locally sourced and sustainable products for creating hotel decors. We need continuous innovation and intervention to reach our goal of building back better. Together, we work for sharing the good practices and moving towards a more resilient, sustainable tourism industry with embedded practices of sustainable consumption and production patterns. So I hope uh, you enjoy our video. Uh, yeah, I'd like to uh, mention, uh, in fact, uh, continuing from what uh, Helena has already introduced. So we all recognize the pandemic has a significant impacts uh, currently and uh, can be in the future. So some of the impacts uh, could be uh, in the short term, some may be in the long term, uh, some uh, could have really direct <coughs> immediate impact, but some could be indirect. Uh, again, any of these might be uh, negative, but uh, some could be also positive. Uh, maybe the good chance uh, we remind ourselves and uh, look at uh, what could be a challenge and what could be opportunities. Um, so the good chance uh, we are joining together uh, to look at uh, can be from uh, consumption, uh, can be from uh, production, uh, can be from uh, uh, producers uh, or consumer or uh, policy decision maker. So hopefully uh, each of us uh, would have uh, some role uh, to share our experience information and can be possible action. So uh, let's uh, move on. Uh, uh, the next three presentation uh, will be, uh, be more specific on how we understand a particular aspect and the case. The first uh, presentation uh, uh, would be uh, on the topic of impact of uh, COVID-19 on tourism consumption and production patterns in uh, future. This is a case study from uh, our two experts. The first one, Mr. Tomohira Amakawa. I hope I pronounce uh, his name not badly. He's a co-founder uh, of uh, Mana Earthy Paradise. Uh, he will share by uh, Another speaker uh, in the same session, uh, Mr. Nokpon Te Chap Pangam. Again, I hope not really badly pronounced uh, his name, uh, who is a founder and CEO of a uh, uh, non non uh, organization. So let's uh, welcome uh, Mr. Uh, Tomohira. 
Hello, everyone. Thank you for the kind introduction. Can you guys hear me OK? Yes. Yeah, great. Yes. All right. Um, I'm calling in from Bali, uh, actually from the Eco Hotel that I'll be presenting you about. Uh, here is the, the view that I see in front, of my, in front of me, so you can see where I'm at. Um, can I share my screen? All right, so yeah, thank you so much for this opportunity. My name is Tomo Hamakawa. I'm originally from Japan, but I've been in, uh, in Bali for the last six years. Uh, and we, uh, my wife and I started this uh, sustainable hotel about a year ago called Mana Earthly Paradise. Um, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a hotel, it's a hospitality business. So we've been hit hard by the pandemic like like millions of people uh, in other parts of the world. Um, and we're basically trying to survive um, and to come out of it uh, stronger and better. So MANA is a next generation eco hotel. Uh, it's run by um, an NGO called Earth Company that uh, my wife and I uh, founded six years ago. And MANA is based in Ubud, Bali. Um, and we're, many of you have, may have come, been here before. Uh, so it looks like this. We're in the middle of the rice fields, a uh, beautiful area to just even walk around. Here's an aerial view, and there's a reason why the, the red roof buildings are not thatched roof, and I'll tell you more about that later. And so why do we exist? Why does MANA exist in the first place? Um, as many of you know, the, the mass, mass tourism uh, has a, a significant environmental um, uh, impact. Um, so this is data from Bali. Tourists use about 2,500 liters of water per day, while the locals use only 180 liters. So tourists are using about 10 times more or even more. Uh, similar data for uh, waste. So tourists generate on average about 3.7 kilos, uh, while the locals generate only 0.7. So it's more than five fold. And in the case of Bali, most of this uh, trash actually ends up in the landfill. Um, so it's a really not a sustainable uh, consumption um, that's practiced by the tourism industry. And so when we started um, this, when we when we started designing this place, we really wanted to be part of the solution and not the problem. Uh, and we didn't just want to talk about it. We really wanted to uh, be the change uh, that we wanted to see in the world. And so what is MANA? So we want to exemplify a truly circular and regenerative economy where the more profits businesses make, the better the world would become. And it's really about the tri triple bottom line, right? So it's the profits, the people, and also the planet. Uh, we're also um, uh, respect and try to uh, incorporate a lot of the Balinese philosophy on uh, Tirhe which is the harmony with the gods, with nature, and among the people. And so the, at MANA, we have three main facilities. There's the hotel part, the villas, there's the restaurants, and also there's the market, which is just actually just um, below where I am I'm, I'm, I'm standing. So the eco villas. So we, the, the six uh, villas are actually made of this, uh, this technique called earth bag. And it's a very simple, cheap, fast, durable, ecological way of building. Uh, and because it's so innovative and, and uh, cost effective, um, it's actually used in um, refugee camps um, and uh, promoted by UNHCR. And I've also heard that it's now being used in space missions by NASA. So it's a really um, kind of pioneering technique uh, that has minimum uh, environmental uh, burden. And the other thing is that it's slow heat transfer. So it's quite cool in the, during the day because it actually gets the, the cool air uh, in, inside um, and then uh, uh, actually stays quite warm during the night because, they're, because of slow heat transfer. Uh, this is what it looks like inside. So there's, uh, we 
100% of the light is, is powered by solar. Uh, we're using bamboo, another uh, sustainable material. Uh, recycled mattresses, which my friend Naps will talk more about uh, in a little bit, right after me. Uh, and then also all the wood that you see is actually sourced uh, sustainably um, from a government protected forest. So we didn't cut down a single tree um, uh, that, that wasn't protected or um, that wasn't actually, uh, that wasn't recycled. Uh, another view, so there's earth bag, there's also the, the door that's recycled wood. And then there's also rainwater. Um, so I mentioned the, the, the restaurant and the office buildings are actually using regular panel roof uh, to be able to collect rainwater. And we uh, harvest, uh, we collect the rainwater in underneath this water tank, um, uh, underneath the, the parking lot, and we filter that water. And so all the water uh, that's uh, supplied to the kitchen, to the villas, to, to everywhere is actually drinkable already. Uh, and so we also serve that water uh, as drinking water. And we're also using upcycle glasses. This is a view of the uh, toilets and the shower. Uh, so again, using rainwater and also using this eco shower head to reduce uh, water consumption. Also using 100% uh, natural soap so that we don't uh, pollute the environment. Uh, this is the view of the dormitory. So we also wanted to make um, this kind of sustainable tourist experience into an affordable one. Uh, because as you know, this, this sector is also becoming high end, becoming a luxury thing. But we really wanted to make this uh, affordable and accessible even to uh, students and, and uh, young people. So this place, uh, the dormitory is about $20 a night or even less. Uh, and then people can really experience what it's like to, to be you know, future oriented and, and sustainability focused. Uh, and so you get your own um, power charger uh, for your devices that's powered by by solar. And again, all the wood is recycled. Uh, this is a view of the outside, so solar panels. There's a thing called a wastewater garden. So we try to clean, filter the wastewater from the villas as much as possible locally before releasing that water. Um, and so we, we actually spend a lot of effort in, in terms of water, so getting water from the sky. And then once we use it, we try to clean that water uh, through plants actually, very low technology, right? Through the use of plants that actually thrive in, uh, thrive in wastewater. Next, uh, about kitchen. So the food that's, that's served at, uh, at our kitchen is also quite, quite particular and, uh, and unique. Um, so we try to do farm to table as much as possible. We have a permaculture garden on the ground. So a lot of the vegetables that we uh, a lot of the vegetables that are served in the restaurant are from the, uh, from the garden. Um, we also do organic, no MSG, no GMO, uh, no beef. We're also using heirloom seeds. Um, yeah, and then there's a soup called the veggie broth, which is actually basically food waste. So vegetable, like vegetable skin and vegetable uh, parts that are usually thrown away. But if you actually boil that for a long time, it's the most nutritious part and it's also delicious. And so we're trying to minimize waste, uh, food waste as much as possible. Here's what our food look, looks like. Um, image of a farm to table. So growing pumpkin in, on, on site and then turning that into delicious pumpkin soup, which I actually had just an hour ago. Yeah. Upcycle glasses, as you know, so we're using uh, old wine bottles, beer bottles, uh, different kinds of bottles. Um, so we don't have to uh, basically create something new from scratch. This is what the restaurant look like, looks like. So tholite, rain catchment again, wastewater garden on the sides. And then the Mana Market is a shop that sells um, organic, ecological, ethical, social, and local products. And so some of the products that are sold here um, are reusable pads, um, also a zero waste um, concepts. So selling soap and other things in bulk, um, salt made by NGO. Basically, the, the, if you buy something here, you know it's good for the environment, it's, you're contributing to social impact, and it's also good for yourself um, because it's, it's natural and organic. 
and all those things. So, yeah. So very, you know, uh, we are NGO. Um, and so we really um, have a particular way of doing things and, and, and making sure that the, all the products are procured and supplied from, um, from ethical sources. Some of the other facilities, um, Yoga Shala, Permaculture Garden, Kids Playground, that's coming soon. We also have a lot of events, um, farmers markets, uh, movie nights, fundraiser events. A lot of these things are hard to do uh, in this pandemic, as you guys can imagine. Um, but uh, in, in, in the last few months, we've also tried to do things to really support each other, support communities around us. Even though we ourselves are struggling uh, financially, we, uh, we want to uh, become a platform so that other uh, you know, people, businesses, communities can actually support each other. So we held a local food uh, market uh, to support local produce, food producers and vendors that are hit hard by the pandemic. We also hosted a local fundraiser to buy products made by rural villages in Bali. So this is like traditional fabric uh, traditional like honey, it might be coffee. And so, um, yeah. And then also we're contributing to this initiative that's happening this weekend uh, called the Plastic Exchange, which is a pretty innovative program. Basically locals collect plastic uh, and then uh, are basically sold uh, and exchanged uh, for rice. Uh, and there is some, you know, financial subsidy to, to the system, but it's really you know, helping communities clean up their communities, especially picking up plastic, um, but then um, having some economic return um, from that process. So that's about it from my side. I hope that wasn't too long. Uh, happy to answer any questions. If you guys want to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, um, or whatever, or want to message me with questions or whatever, uh, yeah, please click any of these links and uh, yeah, looking forward to keeping in touch with everyone. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, uh, Tomo. Uh, very interesting uh, manner. Uh, Thank you. Mr. Nopon, would you like to continue? Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? Yep. Hi, good afternoon, um, everyone. I'm calling from Bangkok. Um, so my name is Nopon Deshapanyam or NABS. I'm the founder and CEO of Non Non. Um, so it's the mattress that uh, Tomo mentioned earlier. Uh, hold on, please. Oh, sorry. So our mission is, um, so we want to help businesses eliminate their upfront investment, uh, especially those on products, and also help them eliminate the concept of waste through a platform that combines product subscription model or rental uh, with end of life recycling. So the, the first product category that we focus on is mattress for hospitality businesses, such as hotels, resorts, dormitories, et cetera. So um, these are the pain points faced by um, hospitality businesses um, currently. So a lot of them can't afford to purchase high quality mattresses. So by, hold, by high quality, I mean mattresses that, that last um, longer than two to three years. Um, so the low quality mattresses last only up to three years and they would have to be thrown away. Whereas um, high quality mattresses are not only more comfortable, but then only last up to 10 years. And the second pain point is um, hotels, resorts, dormitories, they all have difficulty disposing of their used mattresses in ethical, eco-friendly manner. And the third problem is mattresses recycling is not currently financially viable. So that's why like, around the world, hundreds of millions of mattresses uh, are placed in landfills or openly burned or incinerated or flight tipped every year. So it's actually quite a crisis that we are facing. So our solution is we provide mattress as a service. Um, so it's a form of rental. So our customers subscribe, use, return, and return the mattresses. And in this way, we can recycle the mattresses at the end of their lives. Um, so our model is actually pretty simple. Uh, we acquire the mattresses at cost from the from the manufacturers, and then we rent them up to our customers. Our customers then pay us monthly for the mattresses. So um, we start from 65 baht per month per mattress in Thailand, and abroad, we, uh, our rental fee starts from $1.9 per mattress per month. And uh, at the end of the subscription, which lasts between five to 10 years, that is 60 to 120 months, we um, collect back the mattresses for free, and we take them all apart and we recycle everything. 
And to fund the acquisition of the mattresses, uh, we use debt financing, which is backed by all receivables. Um, so this is why we make business sense. Um, so our, our customers, so on the business side, our customers gain access to um, high, high quality mattresses that are not only more comfortable, but then last up to five times longer. And secondly, there's a financial saving of 33% um, over the entire subscription cycle compared to an upright purchase. So this follows from point one. And uh, the third point is our customers enjoy a stress-free end of life disposal of mattresses. So they don't really have to worry, you know, how to um, deal with the, the mattresses that, that, uh, that have really passed the end of their lifetimes. And all our business model is more uh, eco-friendly, more sustainable. Uh, this is why we matter, even though COVID is still raging, but then we expect the resumption of growth in, in tourism globally post COVID-19. Obviously, if we think the good times would eventually come back, perhaps like starting from next year, and second, uh, there's a growing demand from the businesses to um, and their guests for, for more affordable, eco-friendly business solutions, uh, obviously driven by the worsening environmental crisis. And third, there's an elevated growing demand for, um, for businesses for subscription-based business solutions to reduce their front investment, especially post COVID-19, because now cash is king and then more businesses are looking to save their, their front investment. And fourth, um, circular economy business like model like ours has emerged as the world's future operating system. And this is the addressable, addressable market size. So on the right hand side, you can see the number of new mattresses that we needed by the industry around the world over the next like five years between now and 2024. So as you can see, like millions more mattresses are due to enter the market, um, you know, within the next five years. So without our business model, all these mattresses would eventually become waste and end up in landfills, in the oceans, in the rivers, or getting burned awkwardly. But on the business side, um, we think the market will be worth more than $1 billion from 2021 onwards, or next year onwards. And these are our supplier partners. So um, in Thailand and CRMB, we work with Springmate. Um, so we work with uh, leading brands, leading mattress brands in each market, in each markets that we operate. Uh, so in Thailand is Spring Made, in Indonesia is Spring Air, and in India is Duroflex. So we have plans to expand to, all, uh, to other countries in Southeast Asia and uh, also to South Asia as well. So this is our traction so far. Uh, so we started in the third quarter of 2018, and at the moment, uh, 308 mattresses have been deployed. So we have six customers in Thailand, uh, B2B customers, and we have three B2B customers in Indonesia, including Mana, Tomo's um, resort. And we have ex started experimenting with um, the retail customers as well. So that's why we have two in Thailand, two retail customers. Uh, so this is how our mattress can be recycled. Um, so a mattress is like a sandwich. Um, so it comprises uh, the inner structure, basically springs and forms, like polyurethane forms, which are kind of plastic. and the whole um, structure is upholstered by fabrics and, and fibers. So the, with the fabrics and fibers, um, these can be upcycled or reused as um, industrial oil filters and also have other textile applications. And the steel springs can be melted down and reused again as steel. And the forms, the polyurethane forms, can be chemically broken into what is called polyomonomers. So polyomonomers are the building blocks, the constituent molecules of polyurethane forms. So by breaking down the polyurethane forms into polyomonomers, we can actually like end up creating new forms from these monomers. Uh, so this is how we imagine that the mattress could be recycled. So, uh, so at the moment, um, the first lot of mattresses will be returned to us in around five years time. So we're doing more research on how to make sure that the recycling process could achieve break even economically. Um, so more research is, is needed because at the moment, um, Mattress recycling, as I mentioned earlier, is, an, is, an, a, a, is not a financially viable business. So, um, so at the end, if the recycling process, if our, re if our re recycling process doesn't end up breaking even, then we would have to subsidize the recycling processes with the profit generated from the subscription side, from the rental side. So that is for me. For me. So um, I would be happy to um, answer your questions after this. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Nap. Uh, I think we have heard uh, from another interesting case. Uh, both of them have uh, 
something common in terms of uh, uh, production, uh, obviously related to the consumption. Uh, uh, very nice that we have heard from the practitioners, also expert, uh, talking about both uh, short term and Cernap also realized about the long term. Uh, good to hear that after some years, uh, there will be a growing demand on the mattress as we try to do more recycle. Uh, I think we like to move on and uh, before that, uh, like to remind participants, uh, we will have a Q&A before closing session. So like to remind if any of you would like to send a question, comments through the chat, uh, you may do so now until before the Q&A session. And uh, we skip uh, Q&A uh, at this point and we will uh, come by after three presentation. Uh, to move on, uh, I think we have heard from the practitioners uh, on specific uh, production and uh, aspect. Uh, maybe the good chance now to hear about the prospect and challenge uh, covering uh, tourism in uh, Bali. So we going back to Bali again, but I guess this would be a broader contents will be presented by Dr. Akung Suyawan uh, Viran Nata, uh, who is the head of Center of Excellence uh, in uh, Tourism, Udanaya University, uh, Bali. Uh, Dr. Akung, please. Uh, yeah, I would like to say uh, about the prospect and challenge of Bali tourism in the era of COVID-19 pandemic. So we, in Bali has been uh, you know, uh, got a very bad uh, situation under the COVID-19 pandemic. So businesses uh, already uh, impact mostly by this kind of thing. But uh, the government in Indonesia uh, try to work on the health strategy first. They have do many things about this. And then uh, after a few months of that, uh, they realized that uh, economic cannot be, uh, what we call, cannot be stay uh, calm, but they have to move on and so on. And then the government of Bali tried to look at what is the impact of uh, coronavirus in Bali. So we say the foreign tourists almost down 100%, minus 99.9, because it's still some foreigners stay in Bali, uh, very few of them, uh, they prefer to stay in Bali and the government of Indonesia facilitating them to stay here. Uh, and then according to the uh, calculation of the government of Bali, it's about 9.7 trillion rupiah per month uh, revenue losses from uh, foreign tourists is about 650 million US dollar per month uh, because uh, there, there, there is no foreign tourists coming to Bali. So in the regional economic, so it suffers so much uh, for the for the second uh, what we call term in this year, uh, economic uh, of Bali has uh, fallen down almost minus 11 percent. And unemployment directly and formally uh, is about 70,000 uh, person. But if we consider informal sector, it could be much more than that. So travel and tourism industry in Bali greatly impacted by the coronavirus. And as say our colleague, uh, Mr. Tomo said that they just uh, got a business in Bali and now they try to uh, do their best uh, to be survived. So uh, this is the number of impact uh, on tourism in Bali, closing hotel operation. Almost 300 uh, star hotel in Bali uh, has been closed. So there are some more non-star rated hotel also closed. So uh, you can see the five-star hotel uh, is about 41 hotel, four-star hotel, 71 hotel, three-star hotel, 118, and so on. 
mostly are in area of uh, uh, Badung and, and then Pasar. So this is the impact of uh, tourism in Bali for, for the hoteliers. So when we try to do the economic recovery, we have to go to the new normal situation. And in my opinion, the new normal is back to normal plus, just back to normal plus back to the beginning as usual and plus the safety and hygiene protocol and physical distancing and so on. So this kind of thing we can see from normal to the new normal. And there's some picture here, I got it somewhere and from hotel, and uh, now they have special treatment uh, using disinfectant or UV light for, for, for the room and so on. So in Bali, the government of Bali and also government of Indonesia also released the handbook of how to, uh, what we call, uh, manage your property and your businesses during the uh, pandemic. Uh, they have to use the health and safety protocol. Uh, yeah, there are some guidelines in tourism and also in specific uh, tourism activities as well, like mice and so on. So that's the uh, the thing that uh, government try to do. But uh, during this uh, coronavirus pandemic, we still have many challenges especially on the health. So if we uh, try to uh, cope with this new era and we have to do something uh, to protect our health. So we need extra equipment. Yeah. It's been extra investment. We need extra materials to fight the COVID regularly, like a disinfectant and so on. So it increased operational costs. Also, when you open your uh, business in tourism, you have to reduce your capacity of business because uh, uh, we have to do physical distancing uh, and then also social distancing. And then when uh, visitor traveling uh, outside the cities to another city, they have to do uh, a certain test. Also, if you go overseas, you have to do a special COVID test. It, become more expensive uh, uh, for traveling. So challenges uh, also for transportation, attraction and tourist uh, generation and amenity. For transportation as well, uh, uh, the transport uh, uh, businesses reduce their capacity yeah, to be able to do the physical distancing. And at the moment we have only a few flights uh, can uh, fly uh, and to become more expensive. Uh, and also for international and domestic, the, the priority is domestic flight and the need the test requirement. In, in some country, I heard that there are free of charge for people who come to the country uh, and they will get a free uh, COVID-19 uh, swab test, for example, in Sri Lanka. But in Indonesia, we still charge them uh, normally. Uh, in terms of uh, destination product, we talk about the amenity. Uh, in amenity, they have to uh, do uh, some extra effort, as I said previously, uh, to protect uh, the guests and, and their uh, 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 employment. Uh, they should have a new normal standard operating procedure. So there will be more uh, procedure should be uh, undertaken by guests uh, through uh, their property before they come in. For example, they have to wash their hand, uh, they have to uh, uh, test, I mean, uh, taking the temperature test and so on. So uh, sometimes it's not uh, good uh, and makes uh, people feel uh, less hospitality. And also in transport, as I said previously, uh, we already said there's uh, less more expensive and so on and then uh, the destination attraction so for the tourist generating regions there's also problem Australia closed border until December 2020 so our main market uh, in Bali especially Australia 
no none uh, of the australian people can come to bali because they close the border also from chinese tourists uh, there's still some uh, what we call uh, challenges for the chinese uh, tourist market to come to bali or to indonesia but we have a prospect in bali we have a uh, geography uh, temperature higher and humidity so that less suitable for covid some people say that but it's not proof yet also in bali we have mostly nature based attraction as well as culture but no nature based attraction uh, will be uh, less likely covid 19 because the in open area uh, and also uh, we have some island small island that can be uh, spread by sea and then protected by uh, by covid from other uh, islands so demography uh, for, for the moment, we focus on domestic market. So number of people in Indonesia to become one of great uh, market. Uh, in Indonesia also we have ethnic group. So a different group have different culture. We have a rich culture so they can visit uh, some area, some, some cities uh, with different culture. So it's easy access as well through a uh, road in an island because there are some places with uh, with uh, with uh, what we call with ferry, you can you can access uh, like in Bali from Japa, you can access Bali by uh, by road through ferry. So uh, what we have to do in the COVID uh, nineteen uh, new normal, we have to change our tourism para paradigm. So in Bali, uh, they have already discussion by the government of Bali. They try to move from quantity or mass tourism to quality of tourism. Because of this COVID, they would like to speed up uh, uh, moving from mass to quality tourism. And also we in Bali, we have a chance uh, to promote nature-based attraction because we have a lot of uh, beach for marine tourism and also for other uh, water sport, ecotourism, agri-tourism, rural tourism. And also we have uh, adventure tourism in, like rafting, hiking, parasailing, paragliding, and also mon mountain uh, hiking. And also we have geotourism, like in the Batur Geopark, we have a geotourism. And uh, uh, because of the open air activity, mostly uh, Leslie like to be uh, uh, infected by COVID. So uh, in Bali, we have a resort type of accommodation. Yeah, mostly resort type of accommodation. Uh, the villa or bungalow, the open air, like what you see before from from Mana Mana Resort, they mostly open air, open restaurant, uh, and so on. So it's um, less likely uh, to be infected by uh, COVID-19. So the activity there it could be uh, much safer. Uh, so what is the uh, we have to do? Uh, in Bali, we have focus on domestic market, short haul flight. Uh, because of short haul flight, it could be consumed less fuel. Yeah, also, we have uh, focus on open space activities uh, in the nature based attraction and also use less energy. It means that when we are, uh, uh, what do you call, it? when we are accommodating the situation now. With the new normal, uh, it seems that we can uh, also uh, use less energy uh, in tourism, and then less energy. It means that less greenhouse gas emission, and then pre prevent climate change. So we will contribute to the mitigation of climate change as well. In relation to sustainable uh, tourism, as I said before, less tourists uh, coming to Bali at the moment. There will be less consumption. So supply can be taken mostly from local production. Uh, when uh, Bali is flooded by a visitor, uh, many uh, supply, uh, food supply from outside the island. When we can uh, take the local production, it means that it will give the local economic benefits. Uh, and also when we use local production, uh, it means it need, need less transportation to bring the products from the source uh, to the market. It means that less gas emission as well and support healthy human life. And less gas emission also will prevent climate change. 
and there will be better climate support the ecosystem when the system supported by the good uh, uh, climate and uh, the sustainable development uh, could 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 be easier to to be reached and uh, as we see i have an idea that uh, the positive side of pandemic covid-19 is the mother nature can bred easily less pollution less impacts on climate change on the covid-19 can stop people going out so uh, you got a problem with tourism but in in the same time uh, this uh, pandemic bring a uh, good thing for the mother nature so i think it's it's a it to become return point for us we have to think uh, a bit uh, uh, what we call uh, we have to think uh, back that what we have done before maybe is harm for the mother nature so now we have to look after mother nature very well so uh, we have to move from mass tourism to the quality tourism that's all my presentation thank you very much if there is any question so we will be happy to discuss later thank you many thanks uh, dr akum uh, i look forward so to i have to stop return back to uh, bali hopefully <laughs> very yeah happy. welcome welcome to bali again villa so we will have some uh, something new to see <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah. so yeah. can you stop my share because my oh uh, yeah stop my sharing okay have been done the stop okay thank you okay it's good thanks uh, dr akung again uh, quite interesting uh, what's happening in bali and you have mentioned both uh, very emerging challenge uh, we have seen and uh, anyway still some opportunities uh, you have uh, identified uh, Okay, to remind, we will move the uh, question and answer to a bit uh, later. Uh, so maybe a good chance uh, to uh, cover the last uh, presentation uh, on the topic of community-based tourism and small, medium enterprise uh, for adapting to the new normal. Uh, this will be done by myself. Uh, uh, also quite a good chance uh, continuing from uh, earlier speakers uh, talking about uh, production and a number of points that Dr. Akung has mentioned in terms of some uh, opportunities. Um, so let me share my screen. Yeah, I'd like to uh, focus on uh, community-based uh, tourism and small, medium enterprise, because uh, earlier speaker have also mentioned uh, that could be always the uh, impacts uh, to any of this, but uh, some opportunities uh, <clears throat> might be interesting. But I also like to go to some specific case uh, based on uh, our student research and <clears throat> research that we have been working with uh, some of our uh, partners. Uh, maybe a good chance to summarize uh, based on uh, this uh, current slide. Uh, we have seen a number of uh, challenges. In fact, it's my intention to put a more number of opportunity on this slide, <laughs> simply to encourage uh, what we are discussing. Yeah, we know that the challenge, uh, uh, number one, is uh, social distancing. It's quite cross-cutting. So whatever we <clears throat> have been doing and maybe in the near future, still very much uh, recognized on this one. And a number of international travel restrictions. Uh, uh, we have heard from uh, earlier speaker also talk about some change in terms of packaging amount, maybe even increasing, but also uh, different characteristics, maybe different uh, types of the materials. The impact can be uh, short or uh, medium term at the moment, uh, and I think that's uh, maybe the challenge anything long term perhaps uh, <clears throat> might be still uh, uncertain then uh, try to identify some of the major challenge which i think quite related to what have mentioned in the, been mentioned by earlier speaker and i will go to some specific case <clears throat> to elaborate yeah, number one uh, we recognize that uh, natural resource 
uh, can be much uh, recovered and the quality uh, might be uh, getting uh, better. So this could also be a good chance to, like Dr. Akung mentioned, in terms of the paradigm chip. The small and medium enterprise, uh, we have seen some number of uh, hotels in Bali. It's also quite interesting. Maybe you want to see the percentage of a kind of ratio, but my best guess, uh, the big uh, size, last size of the hotel <clears throat> uh, may be badly affected uh, compared to a small and medium enterprise, not only the hotel, other types of the business. Uh, also, good opportunity for the remotely local destination uh, resources, because we perhaps need to attract uh, uh, local domestic tourists and some uh, different uh, destination and resources. The opportunity on the short food supply chain, uh, there have been uh, some cases I will also show one, uh, so that uh, this would uh, provide opportunity to uh, reduce the cost or uh, look for different uh, types of the customer or alternative uh, food network. Uh, healthy food with eco-friendly material, uh, our earlier speaker have also elaborated from the production uh, supply side. A partnership become uh, quite a good chance uh, at the moment because people look for maybe more partners uh, adapting and there may be some uh, <clears throat> new type of the business called business model uh, to be developed and implemented. And uh, yeah, we have done uh, some earlier research in terms of the resilience and coping capacity on uh, different types of, uh, we starting from the natural disaster and other types of risk. Uh, we consider COVID-19 pandemic <clears throat> is another type of risk. So perhaps we can utilize the knowledge and some measures uh, to deal with the, uh, the context of the consumption and production in the tourism. Yeah, I uh, like to uh, point out some uh, specific case. Uh, this is the case that I just mentioned. Uh, we have been doing research uh, earlier focusing on uh, in fact, the uh, natural disaster <clears throat> uh, regarding the flood and drought. Uh, this is quite interesting case in uh, uh, central uh, Thailand. Uh, look at how community can be uh, resilient to natural disasters. And uh, fortunately, uh, this community also have quite interesting uh, tourism, but very much uh, community-based, uh, small scale, a bit uh, traditional, earlier, not very positive because not many international visitors <coughs> uh, interest on this uh, destination. But at the moment, <coughs> based on uh, even uh, uh, typical type of the disaster residents, uh, we have seen that this can move into uh, SCP in uh, tourism. <coughs> you can see from the pictures in terms of uh, agricultural products, uh, nature-based, and uh, both uh, 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 fish and plantation, including uh, some uh, good uh, skill experience of the local people to deal with uh, uh, some other type of the risk. Uh, they have been quite well adapting to the flood and uh, drought. At the moment, they could uh, utilize uh, their capacity, uh, luckily, to attract the local uh, tourists uh, to their area. Uh, this is based on one of uh, our uh, student research. Um, yeah, another uh, interesting case, uh, which is also from uh, another student research in uh, northern Thailand. Yeah, earlier on the left-hand side, uh, as uh, we recognize, there have been some business uh, called like stay like uh, locals, eat like locals. Uh, so earlier the Visitor, both domestic and traditional uh, tourists, uh, like to visit uh, these kind of places. At the moment, <clears throat> we have less uh, visitor, particularly from international uh, travels. Now, the, this homestay has ad uh, uh, adapt itself, uh, modifying into some other type of the uh, products still based on agriculture. And at the moment, uh, look at more on the community base, using online, uh, become an agro business uh, delivery. <clears throat> now they 
reduce the realize uh, from the visitor, but they could connect uh, sending their products uh, to uh, online system uh, short and long distance. So it's quite interesting. I hope there would be uh, other cases similar to this one. Uh, this provides some kind of practical opportunity. Um, another case is uh, based on uh, our another student research uh, now conducting in uh, Bakan in uh, Myanmar. Yeah, I was told that a uh, number of tourists uh, very much uh, reduced, particularly international arrivals. There are some uh, domestic visitors still remain, but <laughs> very much uh, also uh, reduced. So this uh, showed the case that uh, the local people, they still utilize uh, what is called a jackery. <laughs> it's a kind of the uh, a palm tree uh, products to produce uh, a kind of uh, sugar. Uh, so earlier, they uh, similarly need to rely on the visitor to come and buy and take the product by themselves. Now, because of still a uh, really good uh, local demand right, uh, or even uh, international demand, they could uh, adapt uh, same products uh, to sell online through social media. Uh, another opportunity, <laughs> in fact, um, also the challenge because they need to put into packaging. Uh, earlier might be something like traditional plastic or not eco-friendly products. But very nicely done that uh, they have the idea to look for more eco uh, packaging. <clears throat> so this uh, coming from their own community-based uh, tourism and uh, also represent a small uh, enterprise. Uh, so I like to uh, present a bit more detail on uh, two cases uh, to elaborate <clears throat> on the CBT community-based uh, tourism and small and medium enterprise. Yeah, these two cases uh, uh, are based on uh, our good experience uh, in the earlier research uh, recently completed. Uh, we have worked with an uh, organization called uh, DASTA. Uh, this is an area for sustainable tourism administration uh, to gain uh, this experience. And I'd like to briefly share with you. Yeah, the first case is uh, really about community-based uh, tourism development in uh, selected uh, destination. And the second case uh, uh, dealing with uh, SME, but focusing on the capacity building, uh, developing uh, training uh, curriculum in the tourism accommodation sectors. Uh, these are the pictures uh, from uh, the project showing uh, some community-based activities and uh, uh, training uh, conducts uh, as a pilot uh, delivery of the program. Uh, yeah, this uh, slide show uh, some some detail which I will not go to, but uh, we could utilize uh, any of the community-based tourism. Uh, this is the name of the community we uh, cover in uh, the project research. And uh, there are a number of tourism activities and could be uh, categorized into different types from uh, AC like accommodation, tourist uh, attraction, uh, learning center, uh, recreational activity, transportation, information and service center, and manufacturing products uh, for tourism. I think these are quite a typical types of the uh, uh, sectors. And we can see that the pie diversify among these uh, community-based uh, area uh, covering uh, different types of the uh, tourism sectors. Uh, some uh, uh, might be uh, not very positively affected by the COVID, uh, but some of these uh, could have some good opportunity to uh, continue and even adapt themselves because as we discussed so far, they are not carrying very uh, big investment or <clears throat> high cost and they might be easy to adapt to the ongoing uh, pandemic. Uh, yeah, this is a detail of uh, those uh, communities. In fact, earlier we uh, worked on how to uh, implement 
uh, any measures at the community base to reduce uh, greenhouse gas, <clears throat> basically to uh, mitigate uh, greenhouse gas, uh, reduce uh, climate change impact at the community scale. So among this uh, total of nine community lists, yeah, we found that uh, there are uh, popular types of the uh, greenhouse gas emission source uh, from uh, energy, transportation, and waste management. And we have seen that uh, uh, they prefer, uh, this is based on uh, community-based uh, involvement and selection. Uh, they prefer some of the simple less investment and maybe short-term impact of any mitigation measures, yeah, adapting to more efficient energy supply, uh, separate uh, and efficient collection of uh, recyclables. Uh, these are quite uh, easily to be implemented and very much uh, they could continue uh, with their own <coughs> initiatives. Uh, they're adopting to uh, increasing efficiency from uh, different types of <coughs> uh, uh, equipment. Uh, this also uh, cover, as I mentioned, uh, different types of uh, tourism sectors, uh, from like uh, food or the restaurant to the transportation, uh, to even the temple or uh, other types of the <coughs> attraction. Uh, so this, uh, very much a, a good learning that the community-based approach uh, uh, could be utilized. Uh, these are some of the selected uh, pictures from the measures. Uh, as I mentioned, they try to use uh, local technology to deal with the energy production, or uh, <clears throat> improving efficiencies of the energy use, uh, dealing with the local resources and uh, uh, very simple separation of the uh, recyclable on their own. So they could reduce the uh, amount of plastic uh, going to the open environment <clears throat> and even earn uh, some uh, revenue at the community scale. Uh, the second case that I'd like to share, focusing on the SME. Yeah, as we uh, uh, know that uh, SME play quite a major role and there are quite a number of uh, enterprise uh, activities uh, within the uh, tourist sector. Uh, some of them can be private company, some uh, do it <clears throat> on the individual basis, some uh, can be at the community group or even uh, non-profit organization. Uh, but uh, uh, many of them might uh, face uh, some challenge because uh, they might have some uh, limitation, not very much uh, well prepared. Uh, so that uh, with the ongoing or uh, dynamic information, <coughs> uh, they could adapt uh, their business. So in that case, uh, the capacity uh, in uh, specific uh, gaps that uh, this F SME might uh, require in order to maintain the uh, basic <coughs> uh, operation of the business uh, so this leads into what could be the capacity building that uh, we may have to think about this might lead into the decision or the policy maker information. Uh, this is uh, one of the slides I show based on the result that <laughs> we conduct the needs assessment and apply the framework of the business model in order to capture different elements of the <clears throat> SME uh, at a certain selected uh, destination. Uh, and uh, we structure uh, the needs according to the business model uh, component so that we identify uh, which uh, uh, components and topics of the training are uh, higher needs <clears throat> for uh, this group of the uh, uh, hotels, small and medium enterprise. And we found uh, some of these <clears throat> They highlight as a different color so that uh, we develop the curriculum based on their priority needs and follow the idea of the business model. Oh, yeah. I hope I can continue. Yeah. 
Yeah, sorry, I thought the question coming in between. Uh, yeah, we have test uh, this uh, curriculum. Uh, there's also the good chance, uh, not only uh, from the on the paper, uh, uh, implemented uh, a pilot uh, training program for almost a whole week. So it's a good experience that our team gained uh, getting the feedback and revise the cur curriculum <clears throat> uh, to move on. Yeah, these are some of the key findings from uh, pilot training that we have uh, conducted. Uh, yeah, we found that uh, this type of the, uh, SME uh, face a wireless challenge and issue towards uh, sustainability. Yeah, the sustainability earlier might be very basic uh, energy consumption, uh, resource use, even uh, some kind of the manpower and so on. Uh, but uh, at the moment, this uh, could add into more uh, challenge uh, regarding the sustainability under the uh, pandemic. So the revision of the needs uh, might be required <coughs> within the same uh, framework. Uh, we also found that uh, this SME uh, have the lack of the knowledge and experience, uh, not uh, real business uh, type, but uh, more on the management side of <coughs> uh, the uh, operation to so require some of the training on what we call sustainable green or uh, eco friendly business. And uh, our training curriculum uh, from the extent we uh, could divide into something maybe uh, very basic because uh, some of the uh, training might want to go to that <coughs> kind of the knowledge or the skill. Uh, some could be intermediate, uh, some could be advanced, uh, subject to their uh, needs. Uh, yeah, these are some of the examples of what have been uh, implemented and hopefully still can be a good choice uh, under the pandemic to deal with the green activities, uh, green buy promotion with some uh, discount, mm -hmm. uh, green uh, meeting, uh, package uh, a number of the domestic organization now still going to these uh, uh, hotels so that they can organize uh, some of the green meeting and uh, they also received uh, comments uh, back and forth from the customer so hopefully these are still a good uh, initiative to be continued with some uh, adjustment yeah, this uh, last slide uh, showing it's a bit quiet uh, place uh, at this uh, destination. Hopefully not because of the COVID, <laughs> maybe it's still early morning. But uh, yeah, this uh, really show a kind of community base, uh, small and medium enterprise uh, types of the tourism. I hope uh, still a good chance for uh, visitors, particularly uh, domestic, to go to any of these places, uh, and maybe any of us can still go to somewhere nearby mm, because they could still uh, have a good chance to accommodate uh, based on what we are discussing. Uh, that's all of my uh, presentation. Uh, what should we do next? Yeah, I hope we are quite on time. Mm? Fortunately, uh, perhaps the good chance uh, at this point, uh, we very much like to uh, give opportunity to participants. Uh, I think we have seen some uh, common messages uh, coming through the chat. Our team also uh, have seen it. And uh, let's see how we move on. Okay, we uh, we finish about the slides about the presentation. I hope that that will be okay. Except for the last of chat, yeah, there is one question from Dr. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah, it's uh, maybe you can start from uh, this one. There is an interesting question uh, that asking um, myself, and let's see if I could respond or any other speaker may also want to share. Yeah. Uh, it said that uh, some tourism agencies which are not located in urban area, 
have uh, successfully transformed their business. And it seems that uh, tourism agency in urban areas become more vulnerable in this pandemic uh, situation. Yeah, could you share your opinion on measure to enhance the survival capacity of this agency? Yeah, this is a very interesting uh, question. And in fact, uh, quite a challenge. Uh, I guess we still need to look for more and more innovative uh, measure. But it was very similar to uh, what we found in uh, earlier project when we try to do better uh, collection and separation of the recyclables. I think recyclable is one of the uh, hot topic uh, representing the like, circular economy, which I also mentioned by <clears throat> earlier uh, speaker. Uh, comparing uh, rural and urban area, uh, in general case, uh, rural area have uh, better opportunities uh, to separate the recyclable so that they can earn money and then uh, they enjoy uh, their activities. Uh, in the urban area, it's complicated, <laughs> including the COVID uh, pandemic. Because we have seen that because of density, because of uh, complexity in the urban area, so, I think some statistics even saying that 80% or even more cases of uh, affected people are in the urban area. Uh, so that's on the COVID side. But on this part, uh, I'd like to get uh, directly to the question. Perhaps uh, some area could still have a big challenge in the urban area. But we believe that uh, some of the urban area, particularly in a bit uh, suburban areas, because uh, our city are very much uh, growing, and there are a number of suburban areas which are not really in the center of the city. Uh, we found that uh, there have been some uh, good possibility uh, for community-based uh, waste separation, uh, recyclable, <laughs> recycling, uh, as I mentioned. And I believe that uh, to adapt to the COVID based on community-based, there could be some community-based uh, tourism nearby the city, uh, I mean in the suburban area or urban area, which can still be a good chance. In the middle of the city, I maybe owe you because it <laughs> uh, might be a bit uh, challenging, but I don't know if any other speaker like to share uh, how we have some uh, good initiative in the urban area to deal with the COVID-19. Any of my colleagues like to share anything? Hmm? I hope you have seen the question, uh, my colleagues. Uh, Dr. Akung, uh, have, do you see these uh, questions? Yes, I uh, see. Okay. Can you hear my, my voice? Yes. Yes, uh, uh, this asking about the responsibility of the stakeholders. So, uh, in, especially in Bali, uh, we say that for the first stakeholder, we say the government. The government uh, has already uh, released uh, some regulation related to the uh, new era of uh, normal uh, because of the pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic. And then uh, I think it's every government do the same thing. As well as the industry, they follow the uh, government regulation and in some of government regulation there's a mention to be a certification of the SOP of new normal and then the tourism industry organization put the, them together and they develop a committee uh, under supervision of the uh, government in, in this uh, situation is our tourism office. And then 
based on this they working uh, hand by hand with the industry with the with the property and they come to the property doing the, the assessment and uh, doing the assessment and uh, when it's uh, met to the requirement by the uh, the government and then they will uh, uh, issue the uh, certificate saying that they have done uh, COVID-19 protocol as mentioned by the government, something like that. So this process is still ongoing. I think it's maybe more than uh, 50, 50 uh, property, hotel and restaurant have done it. And uh, uh, in every regency, uh, not in the province, in every regency, they also have their own a team. So, like in Denpasar, Badung, Yanyar, they have their own team. So the process will be much faster rather than only one team in, in the province. That's the or the tourism organization and the, the industry uh, themselves. So uh, the problem is in the community. So in the community, uh, at the beginning of the COVID, uh, the the local community call Desta Adat or customary village uh, working hand in hand and they, they are working 24 hours in their uh, border and stopping, asking people, checking temperature and, and also give uh, hand sanitizer and so on. So during that time, the number of a victim in Bali was very low, only 4% up to four months or something like that. And then because of, they have no resources at all again, because 24 hour uh, uh, walking, 24 hour uh, looking after their village, and then uh, they don't have uh, supported, uh, enough support. Uh, and then it's, it's finished. Uh, but uh, because of this thing, as I think it's from uh, July, August, September, so the number of uh, COVID victims increased sharply in Bali. But now it's already going down again. And I heard a few days ago, governor of Bali giving financial support again to the uh, uh, local villages, uh, we call a customary village. Uh, to do the similar thing as they did at the beginning. But I have no sign uh, the, the, the activity back yet. Uh, maybe the money is not uh, reached the, the village yet, just only information. It could be in the next uh, weeks or a few weeks. I hope uh, uh, they will do the similar thing at the beginning and then Bali will then uh, keep the number of victims very low or, or, or zero or something like that, hopefully then uh, tourism will come back. Without a uh, number of COVID decrease or zero, I think there will be uh, visitors or tourists, uh, especially for foreign tourists come to Bali. So uh, every country will give travel warning or travel ban to their citizen not to go to Indonesia or Bali because of COVID. Thanks, That's a uh, thing that I say, yeah. Th thanks, Akung. Uh, I would like to yes. uh, give a question to Mr. Tomo and uh, Naps. I think there is uh, one question. And uh, if we have time, I can respond to another question. Uh, but uh, let's, I, I read this one. I don't know if uh, Naps and Tomo, you have seen this question. Which one? Which Thank question? you for sharing inspiring story of your initiatives. Are you currently working with any public sectors, policy makers, or civil society to scale up your activity and impacts? Yeah, so I just responded to that question in the chat box. Um, and uh, thanks very much for the good question, Anna. Uh, we don't have any direct collaboration with policy makers and the public sector as far as I can remember. Um, but we are part of this new pledge uh, in Bali that was started actually in the COVID era called the Bali Pledge. And it's uh, basically a alliance among um, sort of conscious sustainable businesses uh, to build back uh, Bali greener. 
uh, and it's inspired by the Palau Pledge, uh, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, I mean, there, there are a lot of differences with the Palau case, um, but it's, it's really similar concept, similar intention, um, so that whenever, you know, whenever visitors uh, do come, that they, 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 their intention during their stay is actually to leave Bali in a better state, socially, environmentally, culturally, and all those aspects. Yeah. The other, we are um, actually, as I was, as I was speaking, there is one kind of in, indirect way we're working with uh, with the public sector in Japan, at least. Uh, we are, we have a grant from the Ministry of Environment in Japan uh, to work on a initiative called Operation Green, and it's basically to uh, help organizations, companies, schools, any kind of any organization to, to make the sustainability shift. And it's really, um, and it's, you know, the, the process that we went through as we were designing and building MANA was that we did a lot of research. Uh, we asked, you know, uh, eco-technology consultants to advise us on all the things we can do. And we thought, well, if there is a central uh, location where people can actually, um, go to and find out, you know, many of options, you know, to, to make your operations more sustainable, then that would, that, that would uh, very much improve access to sustainability measures. So that's, that's one thing that um, we're doing. I'll just paste the link um, in the chat box. And most of that work is in, in, in Japan and in Japanese, um, but we have some uh, content in English, so I'll share that in the chat box. Thank you. Hopefully, we can go by translator somewhere. You know, use Google or something. Mr. Nav, would you like to add something? Hmm? Right. Um, thank you, Anna, for the question. Um, right. Um, so, so we, at the moment, we have been trying to get some grants from the public sector here in Thailand. Um, so the grants we just to um, fund all the research on the uh, form recycling. Um, that's what we're looking for. We have also a uh, we also want to apply for um, some grants from the UK as well um, for the same purpose. Um, on the policy side, we haven't worked with anyone at all, I think, so far. Because I think the problem is, like, um, most of the policy makers, they want to focus on, like, quick fix solutions. Like, um, like for example, like, maybe something that would lead to um, immediate re reduction in plastic use, for example. But then, whereas like, uh, we work on a long term, on like a, a much longer time scale. And so far, that's been a challenge in terms of working with um, policy makers or the, the public sector at large. Um, yeah, because obviously the way we do, because obviously it's what it would lead to like um, a long term change. Yeah? We are trying to um, create system, systemic change in the way matrices are, are used. You know, we obviously like, you know, changing from uh, the current model in which matrices would have to be purchased, used, and then disposed, and that by creating ways to the um, to matrices is having to be rented, used, and then returned, and um, it would take us um, obviously at least five years to um, to 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 uh, create a real, a real impact. Um, but apart from that, like your further field, uh, we will get featured on like um a platform uh, created by the Swedish government, by the city of Gothenburg um, later this month. So they're, they're trying to promote our idea in Europe. Um, so I guess that's, that's pretty much um, all the work that we've been doing with the public sector. I hope that answers your questions. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Nath. Uh, I think I can uh, combine two questions uh, we see uh, on the screen, uh, one from uh, Meti Ikayani, and another one from uh, Ranchika. Sorry, I just read names so that <laughs> we are addressing to your question. Yeah, both of them ask about capacity, uh, which I just combine and respond. Uh, uh, in fact, what I have presented, uh, try to point out that even before COVID-19, with a simple idea of the green, eco-friendly uh, business. Uh, the small, medium enterprise still uh, need some uh, support, specific capacity buildings, which we have uh, learned and then implement something. Uh, now with the 
additional COVID-19. Maybe this uh, go to uh, policy, this can make uh, or donors. <laughs> so some of the donors may want to look at uh, this point, how uh, specific support to build, to strengthen capacity of the SMEs. I think that's addressed to uh, the two questions by uh, Meti and uh, Ranjika. Yeah. So we could uh, utilize uh, similar experience, uh, needs, training need assessment, and uh, with a different uh, specific uh, business uh, or areas <coughs> destination so that uh, some of the capacity building uh, program could be developed. Uh, and would be nice to get, uh, this could uh, call for partnerships, I have mentioned. Maybe that's a good chance now. I, I remember when we had a uh, uh, big uh, tsunami in uh, 2004 right, in uh, Banda Aceh. Uh, some of the area have a lot of uh, donors support, but uh, not enough area to provide for the donors. That's mean uh, a bigger uh, budget or support than the need, <laughs> but it's uh, subject to some management. So under this uh, pandemic, perhaps a number of donors have a lot of money uh, to be uh, provided. Uh, maybe the good chance to prioritize, and uh, this might be some of the idea. Uh, I hope I have addressed at least partly uh, this uh, question. Uh, any other points that we want to cover? Maybe our team can... The last one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, there's a, I hope, challenging question three question from uh, Farouk. Our colleagues, if any of you could <laughs> uh, maybe respond about uh, aviation sector. Let, let me read the, maybe the last one would be a simple one. If pandemic situation continue for the next few years, what would be norms? for tourism and aviation sector. Is there any research or study on uh, going on? May, may I respond? Yep. Professor? <clears throat> yeah, there, um, there are some research uh, taken on. Um, uh, OECD, I can put in the chat later on. OECD has made some scenarios in terms of travel. Uh, this is being updated now. I can uh, add uh, uh, some more information. And the, uh, the international um, uh, IATA uh, and in, in, in the international aviation agencies also <laughs> Uh, doing some research, uh, which I, I can send to the organizers and, 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 and put some information there. Uh, however, the, the scenarios that are being proposed uh, for the rebound of the tourism sector is not uh, positive. Uh, it all depends on when the vaccine is going to be found out and when it's going to be uh, implemented at, uh, uh, at a, a global scale. So it's expected that aviation will still have uh, major challenges until the end of 2021. Um, there will be still some regulation in places, even if the vaccine is found in the first quarter of 2021, as expected. Um, uh, as a solution, uh, some countries are investing quite a lot on domestic tourism. Uh, some businesses are also um, changing the purpose of some, uh, some, uh, some of their business models. Uh, for instance, in, in the Caribbean, uh, some destinations are, are, are putting houses that are uh, connected, that can provide access to people that can work from their, 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 uh, their place of work. Um, and then uh, I think that uh, I think it's a, an opportunity also to enhance um, domestic tourism. 
over to you, Dr. Villas, but I, I will be sending uh, more information through the chat function. I also have shared some of the resources that we have on COVID-19 for uh, the people that would like to have access. Uh, many thanks, uh, Helena. I hope we can uh, arrange uh, sharing uh, this uh, good information to the participants. Uh, maybe from our team, any important question uh, I'm missing at the moment? And help? No? Mm. If I'm not missing, sorry, uh, perhaps we cannot cover all the questions coming from the participants, but uh, I apologize if I have missed some of the very important questions, but we try to address as many as possible or uh, combine. Uh, in any case, uh, hopefully we still can keep in touch uh, through some uh, uh, communication. Uh, so at the moment, uh, perhaps uh, I need to end uh, this uh, Q&A session. Uh, thanks uh, to all questions and also respond by our uh, colleagues. Perhaps I turn uh, this to uh, Mr. Tuni. Uh, for the closing session, please. Yes, um, thank you, Professor Vilas, and also my sincere thank to all the speakers. I think we come to the end of the dialogue, which we learn a lot about what the increasing impacts on the environment from the COVID-19 and how it's impacting the tourism sector. We have a, a very good three case studies highlighting the feasibility, how to apply SCP, circular economy in tourism business and policies. And it's very interesting that um, the first two case study did not really mention how the government enabling policies are supporting the change. I personally would have a lot of questions to, to the first two speaker on their inspiration and on the challenges and what the benefit that they see to encourage them to, to come up with this uh, uh, circular economy approach and also sustainability for the local business. And also the third speaker, we uh, walk us through the policy from the government side who actually emphasize on, on how to build back better after this COVID. And we also hear from Dr. Villard on how uh, community-based tourism and SME, somehow what is what are that situation now? And uh, the highlight come out from that is really lack of knowledge on how to be sustainable and the training capacity building somehow would be a very good uh, tool to strengthen this sector to be more sustainable and enhance a certain, certain lifestyle. So with this, I would, before I close, I put in the chat box uh, the access to the EU grant, which actually would be uh, interesting to most of the uh, participants here that I can see mostly are non-government because EU grant targets non-government. And I please explore and this is what we can offer for now. And I think most of the donors are looking for a good case study for funding to build back better. And this is one of the opportunity that I can see uh, many participants are very actively participating and thanks to AAT for a good platform. And as I also thank my colleague Helena in Paris. And again, thank all the speakers and participants and the team behind all this organization. With this, I would like to end the, uh, this dialogue and wish you all a very good day. Thank you.